The title of my sermon this morning is God's Love. We will take our scripture from Hosea 3, 1. Um, we have, it has been a good series, this Hosea series. Uh, and I think focusing on God's love and how God's love is different from our love, and I believe that becomes clear through Hosea 3, 1, is a good way of summarizing this book. And I think we will end our series on the Hosea here. Uh, but before we get right into Hosea, I want to talk about love a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask you, what does a ghost call the one he loves? Do you know? Of course, he calls his, his ghoul friend. Why should you never laugh at the choices that the love of your life makes? Of course, because you're one of those choices. Do you know what's common between the love of your life and an x-ray machine? Both see right through you. There's a quote by Charles Schultz, and, and Sarah endorses this one. He said, all you need is love, but a little chocolate now and then doesn't hurt a thing. And Albert Einstein weighed in. He said, you know, you can't blame gravity for falling in love. I like this quote from Eric Fromm. He was a sociologist and an author. And I think, in all seriousness, this is getting more towards the idea of God's love. God's love is for others. Um, often, the love, the sinful love that we have is self-centered. Even when we love another person, we often we fall into a trap of loving them because of how they make us feel. They make us feel good. So look at this quote. Love isn't something natural. And I would amend that again by saying, in this world, once the world was broken by sin, um, and it's not, it is not what God intended, love is not like God's love anymore. It's, it, it is sinful. It's self-centered. Love isn't something natural. Rather, it requires discipline, concentration, patience, faith, and overcoming of narcissism. Narcissism is loving to look in the mirror where everything is about you. Everything centers around you. And, and I really think that's godly love. The love of God is when we're able to look beyond ourselves and that we love others and we love God first and love ourselves later. It isn't, this kind of love isn't a feeling, but it's a practice. It's a philosophy. So that is kind of some thoughts about love. Here's what Hosea 3.1 says about uh, God is giving a divine command here, telling Hosea to demonstrate godly love to Gomer, Hosea chapter 3, verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, go again. Now, this is a, a retrospective. All the events that we've already looked looked at with, with Gomer, they're not happening again necessarily. This is more a retrospective on what has happened with Gomer leaving the marriage and committing adultery and practicing prostitution and getting pregnant by men, uh, not her husband. Then the Lord said to me, go again and love a woman who is loved by a lover. And that's a contrast. Love a woman with godly love who is loved by worldly love and is committing adultery. Just like the love the Lord has for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love raisin cakes made by pagans. So, Hosea's love for Gomer is to reflect God's love for the children of Israel. Now, children of Israel represent people that are in the family of God that are committing adultery, that are trespassing, uh, uh, committing iniquity against God. And so, un unfortunately, as we've said before with Hosea, we are like Gomer, the adulteress. We are Israel who is going after pagan gods. 
Now, what is it meant by raisin cakes? Well, raisin cakes were little sweet cakes that they would make when they would have the festivals for the pagan gods. It was a treat. People looked forward to it. And so the comparison here is we whimsically like raisin cake. That's a little, a treat, a treat. You know how you feel about a treat? And we prefer treats to the love of God, to prioritizing God, concentrating, focusing our love on God. We trade it for little whims, fulfilling whims. Look in Jeremiah 7, 18. God says to the children of Israel uh, through Jeremiah, no wonder I'm so angry. Watch how the children gather wood and the fathers build sacrificial fires. See how the women knead dough and make raisin cakes to offer to the queen of heaven. And isn't that interesting? How do they offer these raisin cakes? By enjoying them. Again, a very self-centered pagan ritual. Queen of Heaven is Asarte, uh, the wife of Baal in the Canaanite pantheon of gods. They pour out liquid offerings to other idol gods or other gods that are, that are idols, that are not real gods. In Hosea 3.1, the word love appears four times in Hebrew. The Hebrew word has a wider range of meaning than the English verb to love. It can mean to love romantically, to prefer or like. And that's what we kind of see in these verses, that it's a whim, a, a preference, a, 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 a treat, you know. And we say, oh, I love raisin cakes. And then we let that love be more present in our day-to-day -day life. I love raisin cakes than loving God and being loved by God. It, the Hebrew word can mean to do acts of love for. Take out the garbage for your wife because you love her. That's an act of love. Uh, it can mean to be loyal or compassionate towards. God's love is extremely loyal towards us. And Gomer's love and the children of Israel's love was not loyal. It also can mean to be allied with. We love our crowd. We're allied with our gang. And sometimes that's way more important to us than, than our love. Uh, in comparing it to the Hebrew words for love, I'm sorry, in comparing the Hebrew word for love to the Greek usage, which is very familiar to us, most of us in the New Testament, uh, this Hebrew word can mean the divine love, God's divine love, and that's the way we're contrasting it today. And that is agape, called agape, there in the Greek. Uh, parental love, which is storge in the Greek. And and I just I truly believe that loving my child has helped me a tremendous amount understanding God's love for me. It is unique. It is a unique kind of love where we want so much for our child to be healthy and have opportunities and to not make choices that are damaging to themselves. I, I really think this Storge has given me a great deal of insight as I've been a parent into God's love for me and his frustration with me when I don't do good. Uh, a familiar kind of love in the Greek that is covered by Hebrew word is the general social brotherly love called phylos. Um, we get the word Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a Greek compound word. Phylos, love, and Adelphia is brother, so brotherly love, Philadelphia. Uh, and then, of course, eros, which is the romantic love is included in this Hebrew word. In, the, in Hosea 3.1, Hosea is to show love for his new wife in the sense of caring for her, meeting her needs, protecting her. And we are to contrast, that is a godly love, wanting what's best for her, wanting her to make choices that give her choices 
rather than making bad choices which limit her choices. That's to be constant, uh, contrasted with adulterous love, uh, where Gomer loves evil in the sense that she takes delight in, she prefers it, that she whimsically chooses the unhealthy, the unfaithful, rather than choosing the healthy, faithful. Um, why is life so hard? It's because we are whimsical towards things that don't add to us, that don't make us healthier, don't make us understand ourselves, don't make us understand God and how we relate to him. And then we begin having trouble relating to other people. It all works together. We were created to love and be loved by God. And we were created to love one another in light of that. And in the same way. And yet we choose other things over the important loves of our life. Do you see the difference in that one word between a godly, protective, healthy love and a whimsical, convenient, feels good love? Yahweh, God, loves Israel with a loyal love. And we see that Moses talking to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 4.37, God loved your ancestors. Therefore, he chose you after them and brought you out of Egypt with his presence, with his mighty power. Now, I want to highlight that with his presence. God is there. God has your back. God is ever with you. And if you're in a condition today where you say, I, I don't feel God's presence. I, I don't sense God. The Bible is very clear that you are the one with the problem, that you are closing the door to God, that you are making choices that is shutting God out. In the same way you could do that uh, with a, a significant other or a spouse, there are many things that you could do to push that person away and close the door of love on them. And so if you can't, if you are a believer, if you have invited Jesus into your heart and you don't sense Jesus near you, you're the one that is closing him out. That's what the scripture says. God is the God who is with us. Jesus is ever with us. In Deuteronomy uh, 32, 5, uh, Moses was reflecting on when Balaam was sent to curse the children of Israel. He said God would not listen to Balaam, but he turned Balaam's curse into blessing for you, for the Israelites, because he loves you. He turns curse into blessing because he loves you. That's the love. So this, this love, when it's applied to God, is a very technical covenantal term for a relationship of loyalty. Again, that word, loyalty. In Isaiah 54.10, thinking of some permanent things, using the metaphor of very permanent things, it says, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed before my faithful loyalty shall not depart from you, or but my faithful loyalty shall not depart from you. So something as permanent as the mountains will come and go before God's love will go away. Again, God is there with you, and he's not going nowhere. This earth will pass away, but God will still be there. Nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. Now contrast that with the love of a raisin cake. How long does it take to love that raisin cake before it's gone? 30 seconds a minute. And so the contrast is very stark here. We prefer day to day, we prefer the whimsical momentary love of the raisin cake, a whim over the love of God. But Israel, people of people who should trust in God, take a light and prefer raisin cakes. Again, whimsical, whimsical and self-centered. In Proverbs 4, 19, it says, The way of the wicked is like total darkness. They have no idea what they are stumbling over. We are 
sometimes blinded by the moment to moment, by preferences and whims. And as we pursue entertainment, as we pursue hungers, as we per pursue lust, we are like stumbling in the dark and not heading towards the light of God. John 3, 19 and 20, judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light. People preferred the things of the darkness more than the light, which is the love of God. For their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light of God and refuse to go near it. For fear their sins will be exposed. Do you see how upside down that is? We were created to have a fearful respect of God. We were created to, if you will, fear do, making choices and doing things that are unhealthy for us because that will displease God who loves and wishes to protect us. And as you invert that in a sinful world, we begin to fear instead that we're going to have to pay for our sins, that our sins will be exposed. God's love is noble, unselfish, generous, and protective. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in the trespasses of our sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Note, loved, loved together. As we stumble in the darkness, we are all alone because we preferred, liked a simple, quick pleasure. And we reject this eternal love of God and together with God in favor of those things. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, defining love, it says God's love and the love that we should seek to have for one another as be believers. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. Again, not self-centered. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. Hallelujah that God is that way. But Israel's love for raisin cakes and the adulteress, the adulteress's love for evil are selfish, self-indulgent, and pleasure-oriented. In Proverbs 18, 2, it says, Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinion. 2 Timothy 3. 3 verses 2 through 5 describes love for things of this world. It describes them this way. For people will love only themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobeying their parents, and ungrateful. Always the first step to sliding away from God is to stop being thankful for what God has given us. They will consider nothing sacred. Nothing's off limit. Nothing is too holy to mock or make fun of. They will be unloving and unforgiving. Notice that. Central in that, they love themselves, which makes them unloving. They will slander others, have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. Is that not, this is New Testament. This is Paul's second letter to Timothy. And is it not describing the same thing that the book of Hosea calls raisin cakes for pagan gods? Israel takes delight in raising cakes. It goes on in 2 Timothy to say, these people will act religious 
but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Do you see that? Whatever they can get from religion, the attention that they can get from religion is what they crave because that is about them. But the power to make them godly, the power of the Holy Spirit, they're not at the center of that. What does Paul say? Stay away from people like that. Maybe you can't fix them, but, but you should not be influenced by them. And so this is my spiritual challenge this week. I want you to list five raisin cakes in your life. That is five things that you crave, that you take pleasure in, and there are things that a lost person also takes pleasure in. And so I'll give you two for me. I, I, I probably could list five fairly easy, but two, I love sports. I have my sports teams, and I, I spend energy and time tracking them and what's going on with them and wins and losses and statistics and so forth. Uh, and now note, it's not inherently evil. I'm not condemning it. I'm just saying it is a, a simple pleasure that lost people partake in. Another one, uh, let's see, sports um, and food. I love to eat for pleasure. I enjoy that a lot. Now, I want you to list five and I want you to think about how, where those raisin cakes of your life take priority. Am I giving God who loves me and protects me and is with me, am I giving him as much attention as I am sports or pleasure eating? And if you, if the answer for any of them is, yes, I am giving more energy, time, thought, resource to a raisin cake, something that is not necessary, then I need to pray for God to help me make a change in my priorities. That's the whole thing. It's not, for most of us, it's not that we're doing inherently evil things. It is that we are spending resource on things that we should be spending some of that energy and resource on knowing God better and loving God more. So look at your raisin cakes and pray for God to help you look in that spiritual mirror and understand yourself. Now the irony of all this is that in the Hebrew, the word love is the same for God's love and for the, the raisin cakes. Um, Hosea's new wife does not deserve his love. She has not earned she has not earned it, but she will receive it anyway, and that's important. None of us have earned the love of God. None of us have earned the opportunity of the cross. We simply have the opportunity to accept Jesus and have our sins forgiven because of God's love for us in spite of the choices that we've made and the loves that we had. Look at this, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that in while we were still sinners in our sins, Christ died for us. We do not deserve God's love which is the cross, which is having Jesus pay the penalty for sin choices that we have made. We do not deserve a second chance at going back home and being with God. But God in his grace has given that. But he has been showing that love to Israel and to us all along. 1 John 4, 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. 
So a description of God's love in Psalm 136, 26. Oh, give thanks to God of heaven, for his love endures forever. Forever. When the raisin cakes gone, have come and gone, God's love endures forever. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Note that. Not for God so loved his followers, for God so loved Israel, for God so loved believers, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, perish justly because of the sinful choices they have made, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That is the love of God. That is the love of the God who was betrayed in the Garden of Eden and betrayed each day as we make choices to prefer other things. That is the love and opportunity that he's giving to the whole world. John, 1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Again, there is that parental love that God has for us. In Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God in your midst. Again, God in your midst. God with you, not God who is looking down on you from above. God who came and walked this world in your midst, with you now, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet your fears, your heartache, your anger with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Our response to God, 1 John 4, 9-11, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten and beloved son into the world that we might live through him. He takes our death, we take his life. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. God, our sins, deserve God's wrath. And rather than pouring his wrath and condemnation and death on us for our sins, his son took it to satisfy God's wrath, to take the death. That's what propitiation means, to satisfy the cost of our sins. Beloved, if we, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And life, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. How do we respond? Psalm 37, 7 through 9 is good. Rest in the Lord. God rested man in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2, 7. And we are to return and rest in him. How do we do that? By having our whims taken care of immediately? No. By waiting patiently for God. Do not fret when wicked schemes prosper. Cease from anger and forsake wrath at people who seem to be doing okay and, and are living wickedly. Don't fret. It only causes you harm to fret. Evil doers shall be cut off. They will get theirs. God is just. But those who wait on God shall inherit the earth. So your response to God's love, I think, is epitomized in Jeremiah 29, 13. If you look for me, God saying this to all of us through the prophet Jeremiah, if you look for me wholeheartedly, sincerely, you will find me. I will be found by you, 
says the Lord. Seek God today because he loves you. Let us pray.